In September 1832, the Sligo Journal, published on this very street, reported that Sligo was a furnace, the town had become a place of the dead. In that long ago summer of 1832, Sligo Town earned a tragic claim to fame in medical history. It was at the epicentre of the worst cholera outbreak in all of Ireland or Britain. In the space of six weeks, at least 700 people died from the disease. The real total is probably much more. Cholera claimed the lives of, of those from all classes and creeds, including many doctors and nurse aides. Nowhere in Ireland, wrote the traveller Henry Inglis, did the cholera rage with such deadly violence as in Sligo. So what is cholera? Well, Asiatic cholera had been spreading westward from India since 1817. It's a severe waterborne diarrheal disease which is caused by a bacterium called Vibro cholera. Highly contagious, the typical symptoms include stomach cramps, looseness of the bowels, vomiting, severe pain in the limbs and acute dehydration. And of course, left untreated, it resulted in death, sometimes within hours of the first symptoms. It was an indiscriminate disease, not just confined to the poor, and took its toll on all the townspeople being transmitted through the drinking water. Sligo Town was ripe for an attack, attack of the epidemic in 1832. They were only a few short sewers, all of which discharged into the River Garibald. Much of the town's water supply came from several wells, which had already been declared unfit for use. The use of these polluted wells and the Garibald as drinking sources was instrumental in the dreadful death toll of the cholera outbreak. And of course the disease terrified the public due to its rapid progression from initial illness to death. Cholera had in fact been nicknamed the Blue Death due to the skin pallor of, of those who died and that was, the blue pallor was caused by the loss, the rapid loss of bodily fluids. Few of those who ever turned blue and collapsed ever recovered. And cholera actually split the medical world into two camps uh, at the time. There were the contagious and the miasmus. The contagionists uh, felt that the disease was somehow transmitted from person to person, but the miasmists, who actually held a bigger vote, uh, they believed it was transmitted by foul air and foul odours. Um, and of course, this was long before the modern theory of germ disease, uh, and this is because we didn't really know what the, the correct form of transmission was. Many courses of treatment were tried on patients, including bleeding, the widespread use of purgatives and opium, Alcohol and whiskey in particular was used as a preventative and a cure, but of course all were ineffective. In Sligo, in common with many provincial towns, there was widespread agitation and panic uh, in anticipation of the cholera arriving. Much of this agitation was fanned by the newspapers, several of, what, uh, several of which took a stance against what they called the cholera alarmists. Uh, folk superstition was right. In Ballymote, some 80 people, quote, came running into town, some dressed, some half dressed and others with scarcely any covering, with four blessed straws each in their hand, on quote, claiming to be distributing for a, a cure for the cholera. Uh, and throughout Ireland there was another widespread popular frenzy uh, of the Blessed Turk, whereby a burning sod said to have been started by an appearance of the Virgin was carried from house to house as a precaution against catching the cholera. Um, but of course all of these were ineffective and, and they to really illustrate the folk mind at the time. Uh, in slight preparations were made for the cholera um, by the Board of Health, it was the local Board of Health, and in anticipation uh, and in the hope that cleanliness was next to godliness, they authorised the whitewashing of over 700 houses in town uh, using um, a large number of barrels of lime and the burning of bed clothes uh, and particularly um, and the burning of bed clothes uh, and old furniture. The epidemic arrived in Sligo at the start of August. 1832. Twelve cases presented themselves on the 12th of August, of which 10 died. From then on to the 22nd of August, the Sligo Fever Hospital was overcome, with 61 people dying on August the 24th alone. It was, as the Chief Surgeon Dr. Henry Irwin reported, an overwhelming calamity. When the burial ground of Sligo Abbey overflowed with decomposing bodies, the cholera board ordered the opening up of a trench to the rear of the Fever Hospital. This then became the final resting place. Uh, were up to 500 victims of, of, the, of the cholera. Those who died were very quickly, but coffin could only be procured for about half the victim. Bodies were wrapped in tarred canvas and carried to their grave. The physical condition of the dying, the rapidity of collapse, and the difficulty in detecting signs of life meant the story were right of patients being buried alive. Uh, Sligo was effectively abandoned by most of its inhabitants as the cholera struck. 
Only an estimated 4,000 people of about 16 or 17,000 were all that remained in the built up area. And the rem remainder escaped into the adjacent countryside, camping under hedges and ditches. Uh, self quarantine, a phrase we're very familiar with today, may have helped reduce the deaths. Um, and so great was the fear of contagion from the local country people that few would give food or shelter to the urban refugees. Uh, a cordon sanitaire was set up around the town to prevent people from moving out. Uh, provisions were stopped coming into town, trenches were drug across the highways, uh, and all carriers from Enniskillen in the north were turned uh, back. The only thing that got through was the mail coach, because it carried an armed guard. Um, the mayor, William Foster, rode into Sligo to visit the hospital, supervise the burying of the dead, and preserve order in the streets. On seeing the grounds of the fever hospital covered with corpses, he, quote, felt as though the end of the world had indeed come. In a very few days, Sligo had become the city of the dead. It was not uncommon to see people who had fallen victim to the cholera lying dead in the street. Sligo Courthouse was converted into a temporary dead house with 20 carpenters being unable to keep up with the demand for coffins. So rapid was the death rate. Infectious corpses were wrapped in sheets, smeared with the pitch, and, and to prevent the spread of cholera. And they were removed by the cholera carts, which were employed by the Board of Health. Sligo's medical profession was very badly hit. Seven doctors died during the epidemic, more than in any other town in Ireland, including surgeon William Bell, who was buried in the cholera trench with his patient. WB Yates' grandfather, William Middleton, died only hours after helping a poor man who had collapsed in Wine Street. By the end of September 1832, the contagion had run its course. The Sligo Journal declared that the danger had finally passed on the 21st of September. As the pestilence debated, people started to return to normal and those who were camped in the countryside returned to their houses. Sligo was arguably one of the worst hit places in these islands, with a mortality rate equal to that of many urban areas, major urban areas in Britain and in Ireland. At least 50,000 people died in Ireland in the summer of 1832, many more were infected and recovered. And the trauma of the cholera lingered for decades, eclipsing even the famine and popular folk memory. The townspeople could only hope that, like Dr. Irwin of the Fever Hospital, the slightest suffering would at an end.